Mi senti, Valentina? Sì, ti sento. Ok. Ok, partiamo. Welcome to everybody. Uh, I'm Valentina Foschi and it's a great pleasure today to welcome all of you uh, to the fourth and last webinar of Think Outside the Box, uh, EFL Teacher Professional Development Series 2020-2021, organized by Liceo Nolfi Apolloni in collaboration with Mediateca Montanari in Fano. I'm very happy to be here with you today. And uh, first of all, I would like to thank Mediateca Montanari and Fano Municipality, in particular, Dottoressa Valeria Patrignani, who is not with, uh, with us today because uh, um, she is uh, she's still in a meeting which is uh, not over yet. Uh, so I don't know if she will be able to join us later. Um, but Dottoressa Patrignani, she, she's in charge of the library system of Fano. And uh, I would like to thank her in particular for this long cooperation in the organization of Think Outside the Box. Uh, for those of you who are with us uh, uh, today for the first time, um, let me tell you a couple of, uh, a few words uh, to remember when we started this adventure. Our cooperation began four years ago when we launched the first series of Think Outside the Box, uh, the series 2017-2018. Uh, with the exception of this year, uh, all the seminars were held, uh, in, were held in the beautiful Sala Ipogea of Mediateca Montanari, which is uh, a wonderful conference room situated on a very important uh, uh, site of the Roman remains of Fano, which date back to the first century BC. Um, and these remains, uh, um, it's a wide area surrounded by portici, columns made of bricks, uh, are still visible when we are inside uh, the Sala Ipogea, the conference room. Um, I have to tell you that there is really a magic atmosphere in that conference room. Uh, of course, given the present situation, all the seminars this year have been held online, uh, becoming webinars. Thanks to the technology, uh, many of you, many teachers from all over Italy and uh, someone also from abroad have been able to attend these conferences. Um, nonetheless, uh, we, hope, uh, we hope next year to be able to come back to our Sala Ipogea and to, have, uh, to, have this, to, to, to hold the seminars in presence. Let me tell you a couple of other things about Think Outside the Box. Um, as many of you know, it's uh, on the Piattaforma Sofia, so on uh, the professional development portal of uh, uh, the ministry, the Italian Ministry of Education. Um, and um, furthermore, starting this year, this initiative is organized under the patronage of the municipality of Fano. Um, it's also a great pleasure for me to inform you that uh, uh, this year, we have also widened the range of important collaborations. So besides uh, the long lasting collaborations, such as the one with Macmillan Education and Mondadori Education, um, we started a, in a collaboration with Cambridge Assessment English and Cambridge University Press, among some of the most famous publishers, also with uh, some important language schools, such as uh, a lingua school, Pesaro, or IH Milan, or also with uh, uh, famous writers, such as uh, the Irish writer Paul Martin, or the English writer and university professor uh, Derek Allen, or other teaching language experts, such as Richard Twigg, uh, just to mention some of them. Um, and we are coming to the last, uh, the, the, the most recent cooperation collaboration with the, the Italian Virginia Woolf Society. Uh, thanks to this collaboration, in fact, um, we have the opportunity of having with us today, this evening, Professor Elisa Bolchi, uh, and I welcome her. Um, and she's going to deal with Virginia Woolf. Welcome, Elisa. Uh, she's going to talk uh, to deal with the Virginia Woolf in particular, Moments of Reading, Virginia Woolf's Thought and Style. That's the title, title of our conference today. Um, a few words about uh, Professor Sabolki. She's Marie Curie Research Fellow at the University of Reading in the UK with a project titled Virginia Woolf and Italian Readers, which studies the reception of Virginia Woolf in Italy. She's also, she's also written several books about Virginia, and she's a founding member of the Italian Virginia Woolf Society, together with Professor uh, Nadia Fusini. Uh, she has also taught English uh, literature at Università Cattolica del Sacro Cuore in Milan for several years. 
Um, I would like, I would like also um, on this occasion to thank Professor Paolo Severini, uh, one of my colleagues at Liceo Nolfi Apolloni, who contacted uh, Professor Bolchi last October, originally uh, thinking of a conference for the teachers of our Liceo Nolfi Apolloni and the students of the final year. Um, well, we then discussed the project together and uh, I proposed him to widen his first idea so to include the seminar within Think Outside the Box and make it, ava uh, make it available to all of you who are here with us uh, this afternoon. Um, so thank you, Paolo. Thank you, uh, Professor Sabolki. Um, thank you. Let me now introduce uh, uh, Professor Samuele Giombi, the headmaster of our Liceo, the headmaster of Liceo Nocchia Polloni, who is going to bring his welcome to you. Um, and, um, and I want also to thank him uh, for uh, having supported us uh, with this uh, uh, project and this initiative, especially this year, uh, in which, I mean, things are very difficult. I mean, holding, holding uh, seminars online uh, is very complex uh, and um, thank to him uh, for all his uh, support. Um, now I'm passing on to, to Professor Samuele Giombi, the headmaster of Luciano Capolloni for his welcome. Uh, grazie Professor Giombi, uh, lascio a lei la parola. Grazie, no, no, in realtà chi deve ringraziare sono io, non, non voi me, ma io voi, perché certamente questa, questa iniziativa di Thinking Outside the Box meritava di essere continuata. Eh, è un'iniziativa che è ormai pluriennale nella, nella storia del nostro liceo Nolfi Apolloni e che quest'anno abbiamo avuto la necessità di trasferire diciamo, da una forma di presenza nella, nella sede prestigiosa della Mediateca Montanale a Sala Ipogea, come ricordava prima la professoressa Foschi, in questa dimensione così in streaming, in video collegamento, certamente riduttiva probabilmente, però eh, necessaria. L'importante era non interrompere questo filo perché è un filo, è un filo importante per noi. E del resto chiudiamo questa sera questa serie di seminari Finger Soy the Box nel modo forse anche più, come dire, più coerente con lo spirito della stessa iniziativa perché se eh, si tratta di pensare al di là delle scatole, al di là dei confini direi quasi in un certo senso Virginia Woolf si presta moltissimo a questo perché eh, diciamo, il ruolo, l'importanza che questa scrittrice ha avuto al di là dei confini della letteratura inglese in senso stretto per la letteratura, direi la cultura più in generale del Novecento, sono certamente noti e abbiamo anche il piacere stasera di avere una studiosa che li ha, che li ha ben studiati e che è affermata in questo campo, la dottoressa Bolchi, che ringrazio per aver accettato, accettato l'invito, così come ringrazio, l'ha già fatto la collega Foschi, ma voglio ripeterlo, ringrazio anche il professor Severini che ha in qualche modo pensato ecco, a questa opportunità e ha preso i primi contatti con la dottoressa Bolchi. E quindi chiudo rapidamente per cederle la parola, e, mh, avendo ringraziato le persone che ho già citato e naturalmente anche il, il comune di Fano e il sistema bibliotecario eh, del, del comune di Fano che ha subito sposato questa iniziativa e eh, ospitandola fra l'altro in questa circostanza anche nella sua piattaforma e consentendoci con maggior agio di veicolarla in questa forma mediata che stiamo sperimentando quest'anno. Grazie ancora e mi appresto ad ascoltare. Grazie professor Giombi, grazie ancora. And uh, now before passing on to professor Sabolchi, I would leave the stage to professor Severini for his welcome. Paolo to you. Okay, good afternoon, everybody. This is Paolo Severini. I'm an English teacher. And uh, this is a special afternoon because uh, I'm very happy to introduce to you uh, Professor Elisa Bolti, whom I actually came across uh, rather uh, informally on one of the many We School videos where she basically speaks about modern fiction. And on uh, one of the two videos I watched, uh, she was speaking about James Joyce's Evelyn. And on the other one, she was speaking about uh, uh, Virginia Woolf. And as soon as I saw one of these two videos, I just uh, I needed one video to, to watch to understand how much 
this this woman must love what she does how much passion she puts in everything she does and so i decided to contact her immediately uh, via mail and uh, i proposed to her if she wanted to take part in one of the activities that the school north village and north Polonia sometimes uh, um, carries out and she immediately accepted uh, and then uh, together with uh, teacher Valentina Foschi, we decided to include this activity uh, within the Think Outside the Box seminar. And uh, I, I hope you will like it. And so I'm, uh, uh, I'm here, to, I'm curious too, because I, I like Elisa so much. Okay, it's over to you. Thank you so much, bye. Thank you, Paolo. Thank you very much uh, for your welcome. And uh, now I would uh, pass on to Elisa. Um, just uh, one, uh, um, one thing uh, to everybody, if you can remember to fill in uh, the Google form, which is, uh, I mean, the link is uh, in the chat uh, so that we can register your participation. At the end of the seminar, there will be some space for questions. You can ask questions uh, um, through the chat, uh, or if someone wants to um, participate more actively, you can also ask questions uh, um, um, by, by switching on uh, your, your microphone, okay? And uh, also your video if you want to be seen, okay? Thank you very much for your participation. Thank you, uh, Professor Bolki. Thank you, Elisa. And, uh, uh, I'll, I'll pass it on to you. Thank you. So thank you, everybody. And um, I want to thank uh, Paolo Severini in particular, because I like mm, so much being introduced through my passion. Um, I sometimes sounds, sounds like, you know, more, than, more a groupie than a scholar of Wolf, but I think this is so much common in Wolf scholars. I mean, when we gather together in uh, Wolf conferences, international Wolf conferences, it's really, really like, like you know, groupies, group fans. Uh, we're so excited, everybody, because I think it's what you get from uh, Virginia Woolf. So I'll try to pass it on to you. Um, my idea, well, as, uh, um, um, as Valentina and Paolo said to you before, uh, the first idea was to, to, to do this for students, but then we switched our mind to uh, teachers, to professors. Um, yet we wanted st students to be included in this as well. Um, so I will try to, uh, well, what I built for you is uh, um, a conference made of ideas that I often use uh, to talk about Wolf uh, to students, to high school students, because I've been teaching to high school students for a while too, uh, okay, not only to university students, uh, which of course it's a different audience, so I'll try to share with you the ideas I collected along the years to, to understand how many ways exist to, um, you know, to pass the passion of Wolf, the passion for Wolf uh, to students. Uh, because sometimes uh, through anthologies, uh, you only find a couple of passages from her most uh, famous novels, uh, Mrs. Dalloway and To the Lighthouse usually which are not easy novels. And sometimes they're also difficult for teenagers because when you are a teenager, it's very difficult that you can understand the feeling of a woman growing old, the feeling of a woman who perceives that her, her life is coming to, uh, you know, um, to a cul-de-sac, <laughs> to a no exit uh, point. Um, or also it's difficult to understand the development of the mind of a woman, of an artist, uh, and the, the state of mind, the feelings of a mother as Into the Lighthouse. There are other novels which are easier to uh, introduce Wolf through with. But of course, we cannot focus too much. I also know that, you know, as teachers, you have uh, to struggle with uh, programmi ministeriali, with uh, time, with uh, what the many activities that students have to do. 
in Valsi, whatever. I mean, you have so many things to do. So I think that sometimes having a fresh idea, having a new perspective, having a new look might be helpful. And in the same way, I hope that those students uh, who are listening will find some material which might be of interest to them as well. So I will start sharing my presentation uh, because I think uh, it, uh, it will be easier to follow me through the presentation. Okay, can you see the screen? Uh, okay, very well. So uh, why Wolf would be the first question? Well, there are, there are many reasons to introduce Wolf to students. The first, I think, is for her life. She had such an extraordinary life. She was friends to some of the most incredible artists and intellectuals of her time. Some people who really changed the course of history. So what's more fascinating than speaking to students of a younger girl who had amazing friends, who gave incredible parties and did crazy things. I think this is something which might be interesting for them. But also you can speak about Wolf to introduce important social issues and I'll make examples of this. And you can speak, uh, use Wolf to speak about war, to speak about equity, gender equity in particular, to speak about women and so on. But then also modernism. Of course, she was a master of modernism, but she also wrote a lot on the topic. And so it's really helpful to use wolf words when you explain modernism, which is so difficult for some, sometimes for students. And then of course, her uh, prose is useful to make examples of modernist fiction. So these are the steps that I would like to touch, you know, that I would like to make tonight with you. So let's start with the life. Well, in general, you know, the life of Virginia Woolf starts with Adeline Virginia Stephen was born on uh, 25th of January, 1882. Yes, <laughs> okay. But there is one thing in Woolf's life. She was grown up, you know, she was educated as the typical Victorian girl, the typical girl of the Victorian age, born from an educated man, from an educated father, a very eminent Victorian, Sir Leslie Stephen. And then all of a sudden her life changed and she was in the modern age and she was one of the most important thinker of the modern age. So this is the point, I mean, on which we should always focus. And the most important point is that she had this childhood, was, which was amazing. She lived in this very odd house at 22 Hypergate. And all the family lived here, 21 people, because, you know, she had siblings, uh, she, uh, the parents, and then, of course, the servants, because those were the times. And in this house, she really grew up in happiness mostly for most of her childhood until uh, the age of 13 when her mother died. And here, a series of uh, very bad losses started. So she, she loses her mother, she loses uh, um, Stella, who was the, the oldest sister, and so uh, Virginia and her sister Vanessa became the women of the house who had to look after the old father, the old Victorian father who had sent um, male brothers. So Toby, Adrian, and then Jordan and Gerald who were the older ones to Cambridge. So male uh, boys could go to university while Virginia and Vanessa were mostly educated at home, not entirely, but they could not go to university because it was, you know, not nice that such upper class girls went to university, not for their father. So they had to look after these men and they grew up in a very, very Victorian uh, standards, uh, uh, very Victorian society. They had to attend parties because they had to find a husband because for, you know, uh, upper class, middle upper class uh, girls, the only way to have a role in society was getting married. So marriage was such an, a fundamental part of their life. 
And so they had to find a husband. So they had to look pretty, go to dinner parties, be silent, smile. Okay. But these were all things that Vanessa and Virginia were not interested in. They, uh, well, rebels because the father who did not want them to attend university actually left his own library open to them. So they had access to this incredible amount of culture that a man like Leslie Stephen, who was a philosopher and a professor at Cambridge, okay, so <laughs> that kind of man um, had, okay, possessed. So uh, they were educated, they were intelligent, and they were artists. Virginia Woolf wanted to write, Vanessa wanted to paint, but they were like trapped in this life, in this uh, Victorian life. When the father died, they were able to completely change their life and they moved to Bloomsbury, uh, this place which nowadays is incredibly fashionable and cool, but back then, you know, it was um, um, an area for artists. So not, not really the right place for two girls to live alone. But again, this is a strong point. These two girls leave the house of the father not to enter the house of the husband as it was uh, the, the rule, you know, back in Victorian age. They leave the house of the father to enter a house of their own, a space of their own where they could live with the two brothers, but the two brothers attended Cambridge. So most of time, the two girls were home alone. And what happens when teenagers or however young people are home alone? They give parties, people. And this is the point. I mean, this is what Virginia Woolf was when she was young. She was like your students, uh, a young girl uh, struggling to find an independent mind, an independent way of life and uh, searching for life to enjoy herself and live her life as she pleased. The, the only difference was uh, that her friends uh, were some of the most incredible intellectuals of the time. Here in the picture is Lytton Strachey, who will be um, a very important biographer. Or uh, we have Clive Bell, who married uh, Virginia's sister, uh, Vanessa, and Clive Bell, uh, would be an art critic, okay, would become an art critic, or minor kings, minor kings will win the Nobel Prize. So just to give you an idea in, um, in economics. So you see, th this was the kind of friends she had. And why were these friends so special? Because they taught her to think in a very independent way. And here uh, is something I always suggest that you start explaining wolf life using how she spoke about her life. Old Bloomsbury is a very nice essay. Uh, you find it in Italian in many uh, collections, but you also find it, of course, uh, in English. Uh, you know, um, Wolf is out of rights now, so you can access uh, uh, her essays in English uh, whenever you want. Uh, uh, just look for old Bloomsbury PDF uh, and you can download it for free. And this is an incredible essay to introduce her to students because this is the part which I always read to students uh, which describes uh, how uh, the Bloomsbury group, so this incredible group of intellectuals which met uh, uh, in, in the Wolf's house, well, so in the Stephen's house, because Wolf was not married to Leonard already. Um, so the Wolf, the, the, the two sisters and the brothers and the Stephens organized, and which became, as you probably know, you know, the Bloomsbury group became one of the most influential groups of artists and intellectuals of the 20th century. And this is how she describes the moment when these guys entered the house and enter her house for the first time. Well, the bell rang and these astonishing fellows came in. Vanessa and I were in a Twitter of excitement. It was late at nine. The room was full of smoke, uh, buns, uh, uh, coffee. Uh, um, I'm sorry, I cannot. Uh, let's see. Okay. Um, sorry. 
Okay. Uh, buns, coffee, and whiskey weren't strewn about. We were not wearing white satin or seed pearls. We were not dressed at all. Toby went to open the door. In came Sidney Turner, Belle, Stretchy. They came in hesitatingly, self-effacingly, and folding themselves up quietly in the corners of sofas. So for a long time, they said nothing. None of our old conversational openings seemed to do. Okay, you, here you start to see, you know, the difference between the old Victorian age, what I, they have been used to. So men who entered the room with the idea that they have to possess the room and small talking, you know, chatting about nothing about the weather or about fashion, sterile chats. And, and then she says, uh, no, well, none of our old conversational openings seem to do. Vanessa and Toby and Clive, if Clive was, th was there, would start different subjects, but they were almost always answered in the negative. No, was the most frequent reply. No, I haven't seen it. No, I haven't been there. Or simply, I don't know. The conversation languished in a way that would have been impossible in the drawing room at Hypergate. Yet the silence was difficult, not dull. It seemed as if the standard of what was worth that saying had risen so high that it was better not to break it unworthily. We sat and looked at the ground. Then at last, Vanessa, having said perhaps that she had been to some picture show, incautiously used the word beauty. And that one of the young men would lift his head slowly and say, it depends on what you mean by beauty. At once, all our ears were pricked. Is it was as if the ball had at least been turned into the ring. So, you know, il toro scende nell'arena, just because Vanessa says beauty. So I think this is so strong, you know, to, re to really uh, pass the idea that this was the kind of party they were giving, parties in which people talk only if they had something to say. Wouldn't it be great you know if we learned again to speak only when we have something worth being said and here however what she learns is the responsibility this gives to her she feels that if she wants to be listened she has to have ideas and her ideas must be supported by the quality of her thought which is something which is incredibly important to teach to your young students. You have in front of you young people who are used to the idea that we have the right to speak, we, have to, must, we must be free to say whatever we think, which is absolutely true. And freedom is one of the most important thing we have in life, but freedom is responsibility. Uh, having the liberty, having the freedom to say whatever you want to say means that you are responsible for that freedom. You will be responsible for whatever you say in whatever context you say what you say. And Wolf is very precise on this. Never have I listened so intently to each step and half step in an argument. Never have I been at such pains to sharpen and launch my own little dot. And then what joy it was when one's contribution was accepted. No praise has pleased me more than Saxon saying that he thought he, I had argued my case very cleverly. So um, here you see, she, she is really uh, explaining the point of being listened and being part of an intellectual conversation. And it's the first time that women really have this role in high society, okay, with university fellows, uh, intellectuals and artists, okay. So I think this is a very important idea to introduce Wolf. And through this idea, it becomes very easy then to speak of social issues because Wolf, really had this experience, this first-hand experience with the fact of uh, feeling, you know, um, authorized. She, fe she felt uh, she could be part of the discourse, thanks to these uh, guys, thanks to her Bloomsbury group. And this changed her way of thinking, her mind completely. Of course, uh, when you discuss of social issues, there are so many elements uh, you can touch. Uh, you can think of Wolf for her independence of thought. 
She was an incredibly independent woman, okay? She lived uh, of uh, uh, her own work, okay, as a writer, for example, and she had her own uh, press, her own publishing house. She founded her own publishing house in order to be able to publish without having to respect the, con the conventions of the, the general publishing market, for example. And then freedom of ideas, as I said already, you know, this idea that in order to be free and to have your own freedom of idea, you must be aware of the responsibility which comes with this, but also, oh, okay, and the responsibilities which come from freedom. So um, one of the way in which I use Wolf, for example, in classes, I've made um, several workshops uh, with classes, with um, high schools. I use her to touch point five, uh, you know, goal, goal five uh, of the sustainable, sustainable development uh, goals uh, uh, sponsored by United Nations. Uh, goal five is gender equality. And so I used sometimes Wolf to you, and introduce this aspect. And so uh, nowadays that we are requested, you know, with uh, Credito di Cittadinanza or um, all these uh, elements, I think Wolf might be an instrument to speak of certain aspects uh, in, through a different channel in a different perspective. Okay. Of course, A Room of One's Own is one of the easiest essays to read. Uh, I mean, uh, it's less complicated than Three Guineas uh, and it's longer, so it's mm, similar to a novel to read, uh, but it touches uh, many interesting points uh, that you can face. Sometimes you have uh, um, a, an extract from A Room of One's Own in anthologies, uh, and so you can start from there. But I always suggest to start from what she says at the very beginning of the essay. First of all, she starts the essay with, but. Well, this is quite unusual, you know, when you write an essay, you uh, usually have um, to prove your ideas and you must convince uh, uh, the readers or the listeners that your ideas, your point of view is the one, uh, is correct uh, and uh, you, you must prove your point. But Wolf does not speak about a thesis. Okay, she doesn't present a thesis in her essay. On the contrary, she says that she has this opinion that a woman must have money and a room of her own if she is to write fiction. And she starts with but. But you would say, what does women in uh, fiction have to do with a room of one's own? Because she was asked to speak about women and fiction. This idea to start with a but is a way to start with a dialogue. She puts herself in, in dialogue with her readers uh, and with the listener. And this is great, you know, this is, you don't have uh, the uh, scholar who wants to convince you of her idea, but you have a woman who is there to tell you how she came to develop her opinion, not her thesis, her opinion. And her opinion is very strong. A woman must have money. Money was quite, you know, a taboo word for, for a woman uh, in those years. She says a woman must have money in the room of her own is, is, if she is to write fiction. And in order to explain how she came to develop this opinion, she builds, uh, you probably know the essay already, so I'll be very fast on this, but she develops uh, a story. She creates, you know, she tells the story of this Mary. She says, call me Mary Beaton, Mary Seaton, Mary Carmichael. What's the meaning of this? That she could be anyone, she could be any woman. Like, you know, the every man of uh, medieval uh, pageants, uh, the every man is one of the oldest play. And here she is pretending to be this merry whatever, meaning I'm the every woman, because what I'm telling you might happen to any woman in the world. Okay, not only to me, not only to Virginia, but to, or to marry something in particular, but to any Mary in the world. And so she builds her own essay like a matrioska. 
uh, from the college, okay, she starts in the college and then she moves on to the library and then to the books. So you see the three elements are contained one into the other books are contained in libraries and libraries are contained in the college. And the first, and she uses these uh, physical spaces to build different metaphors. And these metaphors help her to build her own ideas, build her opinion together with you. So while you read, you understand how you can develop such ideas, why they have a sense of existing. And by the end of the essay, when you finish reading the essay, you finally understand that, well, you know what? You're right, but not, not because you convinced me that you are right, but because I understand what you made me think, what you made me believe by and by. So what is the first metaphor she makes? Well, this is the college. Uh, the first metaphor is the space. And to do this, she doesn't use the metaphor of the room, which is the title, which is the, the metaphor she started her essay with, but she uses an open space, a public space, and she uses the turf. She tells the episode of Mary, Mary Seaton, Mary Beaton, who is thinking about this conference she has to prepare. And the title of the conference is the same of the conference Virginia Woolf is delivering. And she has to prepare this conference. And while she thinks, okay, to find her ideas, she leaves the gravel and starts to walk on the grass. But she is immediately stopped by the beadle, il vicario, il bidello, diremmo noi. She is stopped by him, who says, no, 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 you can't walk on the grass. Only men, only male fellows can walk on the grass. Women can only walk on the gravel. And she says, well, okay, it's not so important. Yes, the grass is more comfortable, but it's not a big issue. The point is... I was fishing for an idea and this distraction, the thing I had to stop and go away because as a woman, I'm not allowed to enter center, certain public spaces, distracted me and my fish ran away. So I lost my idea. I was fishing for my idea and now my idea is gone. So you see how strong this metaphor is? She's not just saying, I need a room because in a room I concentrate better. I need the dignity of space and I need that this dignity is public and it's made the same for everyone, okay? So bringing this space to a public space, to a public place, it's much stronger. And then she, she makes uh, an, another metaphor, which is beautiful and it's more fam famous. And it's the one of the lunch in the male college and the dinner in the female college. Well, here, the lunch in the male college is very rich, made of incredible food, beautiful food, and everything is served beautifully. You know, all the dishes are decorated. Uh, the table is beautifully decorated with flowers and fruits. And even the vegetables around the meat are so beautiful that they look like composition of flowers. And so that at the end of this dinner, she feels so uh, satisfied. She feels uh, she was worth it. She feels that she, she says something beautiful, no need to sparkle, no need to be anything but oneself. Because it, it's so incredible what you were offered with this uh, lunch that you feel, well, I'm worth it. And so I can be more than I am and I can have great conversation. And so after dinner, uh, after lunch, I'm sorry, they start to a great uh, conversation with each other and great ideas come to the surface. Because she says, this is, this was thanks uh, to this incredible lunch, which make us feel better. Uh, make us feel that we deserve it, you know? Well, in the evening, she goes back to the female college, the women college. And in the women college, well, the dinner is quite different. It's very poor. 
the point is, uh, well, you're lucky that you can study, but the college is very poor. This is all we can afford, I'm sorry. So the important is that you're not starving to death. And so this is just food for you. So no tape decoration for the table. And she is very ironic here. You know, she uh, describes the broth, uh, the, il, il brodo proprio, <laughs> because we cannot uh, talk of a soup, because it is so uh, clear, so transparent that where the dishes decorated, we could see the decoration, but of course they were not, they were white. And then also the biscuits, uh, if it is uh, uh, characteristic of the dis biscuits to be dry, then these were biscuits to the core. So very dry and so everyone passed the water in order to be able to you know, um, eat the biscuits. And at the end of this dinner, she, um, she says that one of the sentences which has been become more, uh, more famous by Wolf, uh, but which uh, is usually misinterpreted completely, which is one cannot think well, love well, sleep well, if one has not dined well, the lamp in the spine does not light on beef and prunes. Well, you find this, uh, you know, this sentence uh, in every restaurant and bars nowadays and cafes, uh, uh, and you have the idea that Wolf was, uh, you know, what we Italian would call una buona forchetta, you know, uh, uh, liking lasagna better than uh, beef and prunes. This is not the point. One cannot think well, love well, sleep well, if one has not dined well, comes after all these metaphors of the lunch in male college and dinner in female college to say that uh, we need beauty. We need more than just bread. We need more than just food. Enough is not enough. And this is so much more than about gender equality. This, is, this has so much to do with suburbs, uh, with, uh, you know, with equality in general, uh, with the idea that if you are to build a better society, you cannot just give bread to the people who will be the builder of the future society. Beauty is part of it. And making these people feel that they deserve what they have and that they are given even more because what they are doing is so important, is so crucial because they are the ones who will be building our future. And this is what Wolf is meaning through this sentence, which has nothing to do with food, simply, okay? So this is one of the idea which I like, but usually uh, you are offered with the idea which is inside the library and you are offered with the, the passage in anthologies about Jude Shakespeare. Um, the, the story of Judith Shakespeare is easy, uh, you know, uh, she says, well, uh, why on her? We only have men written by men, mostly re book, book, books written by men. Where are all the books written by women? Uh, why did women write less than men in the past? Why is it so? Is it just because they are less intelligent, less talented? So let me imagine what would have happened had Shakespeare had a wonderfully gifted sister called Judith, let us say, and she invents this sister by Shakespeare. Okay, Judith. Well, this is usually the passage you're offered to, um, taken from whatever part of uh, this uh, long passage, because it's more or less four pages, depending on the edition. Well, what happens? Uh, simply, she makes the example that if uh, Judith Shakespeare uh, existed, okay, really had existed, so if Shakespeare had a sister, um, she would have been given uh, in wife to their neighbor. She wouldn't have wanted to marry, and so she would have run away from home. She would have run to London. She would have been uneducated, of course, because she could not attend grammar school like William. Um, 
And once in London, she would meet, you know, Burbage or any other businessman uh, of the theater. Uh, Nick Green is the one uh, we've mentioned, if I remember well. Um, what, but while William will make a business with uh, this man and build the globe, on the contrary, she won't be able to act. As you know, as a woman, she could not act. Um, she would not be able to, um, to work. And in order to live, in order to survive, she would have to give herself, okay, to have sex with him. And she would be pregnant and desperate. She would kill herself uh, and she would be buried in an unmentionable place because uh, it's a bus stop nowadays. So this is just to say that it would have been impossible to have a talent like Judith Shakespeare. And this is part of the reason why we don't have women fiction from the past. But also she says something very interesting. I don't remember if I put the slide, no, I'm sorry. But she says something very interesting, which is, however, it would have been impossible at that, to have a, a genius like Shakespeare at that time, because genius like Shakespeare's are not born among laboring and servile people. And she, what, what she was proving was that back then women were like the slaves of ancient Rome, they had no rights, they could not study, they were kept in ignorance. And so in those conditions, you could not develop the genius of Shakespeare. Okay, so uh, this, is, this is the point that is usually made, which I find really interesting because of course, it's so curious, you know, she is inventing this Shakespeare sister and all students know about Shakespeare. Uh, they studied him. So, of course, it's very easy to speak about this passage. But there is another one. There is another passage I like to face with students. But I think it's more um, convincing for them because you can use more uh, modern, more contemporary tools. And it is the one that happens inside the book. So you remember the Matryoshka. We were in the college, and then we pass into the library, and, uh, and then we're back in books. So it when she is in the library, finally Wolf opens the books to see how women are described in these books. And reading these books, there is a point in which she finds out that Chloe liked Olivia. So she is reading this book written by this Mary Carmichael, once again, okay, this uh, fictitious name comes uh, over again. And uh, she finds this uh, book uh, where there is this Chloe who likes Olivia. And she says, do not start, do not blush. That does not meet in the privacy of our own society that these things sometimes happen. Sometimes women do like women. Oh, be careful here. She's not mm, meaning that they like women in a sexual uh, way. I mean, yes, Wolf liked a woman sexually, okay? She had a sexual relationship with Vita Sackville Wells, as far as we know, okay? From their letters, it's quite sure, but... <laughs> um, so they had this relationship, but this is not what she is speaking about here, okay? And in fact, Chloe and Olivia uh, are married. Well, at least one of the two uh, women is married, and women is married and has a children uh, has a son or a, or a daughter. Sorry, I don't remember. But uh, the point is, these two women like each other. Si piacciono. And she says, Chloe liked Olivia. I read, and then it struck me how immense a change was there. Chloe liked Olivia, perhaps for the first time in literature. It has never happened before that a woman liked another woman. Usually, she says, women are depicted as enemies, okay, as uh, um, the, the mother or the sisters or uh, never like friends. There's never a woman who likes another woman. And this is a strong point she makes, okay. And she says, well, what would have happened if this happened to men, for example. She says, the splendid portrait of the fictitious women, because of course women are portrayed, uh, you know, as 
uh, beautiful angels, uh, as uh, magnificent women capable of inspiring incredible poems. Uh, uh, Helen of Troy is an example of these. Uh, yes, but who was the best friend of Helen of Troy? Uh, who did she spoke? Uh, she speak to? Uh, had she a confident? I mean, Helen of Troy was not the Battle of Troy. Helen was also a woman, but they're not described as such. And she says, suppose for an instance that men were only represented in literature as the lovers of women and were never the friends of men, soldiers, thinkers, dreamers, how few parts in the plays of Shakespeare could be allotted to them? Oh, how literature would suffer. Yes, literature would suffer if we had no men who are friends to each other. But this is what happens with women. And um, she says something important. Why is it so important that we describe women friendship? Why is it so important to have books uh, which are about women who like other women's women? Because we must think back through our mothers uh, if we are women. So we, we use women voice we use women narrative, we use women fiction, if we are women, in order to find, to develop our way of thinking. Of course, not only this, but this is important. This is an important step. And if our mothers only tell us about their friends who are enemies, about how uh, women can only be sisters or mothers or daughters. They don't tell us about how incredible friends they can be. Well, we'll always learn that we cannot be friends, that we cannot like each other. And this is a problem because this becomes um, a behavior. You know, this becomes a standard behavior. And pedagogy told us a lot about this. You know, in psychology, we know that if we tell something uh, enough times, that it becomes true. Okay, if we say to a young ch um, child uh, that he is stupid and he is a wicked boy or a wicked girl, he or she will grow up being such. He will grow up feeling stupid. He will grow up behaving badly. The same is for women. If you keep telling women for centuries, for thousands of years, that they can only be enemies, you will have women enemies. And you can see it everywhere. You can see it on social networks. You can see it in the comments that women make to each other so often. And it's time for a change. Wolf, in 1928, when she uh, spoke, uh, at this conference or when she published the essay the, um, the following year in 1929 was very clear about it. We must think back through our mothers and so we must be the mothers who say that a woman like another woman, that this is possible. Well, there is a um, contemporary artist that used this very idea, this idea which is part of A Room of One's Own, to create um, a comic. Uh, she is Alison Bechdel, okay? And this comic uh, is uh, Dykes to Watch Out For. She is a Canadian and uh, she, she is great. I mean, she's very ironic and she uses Wolf a lot in her work. But she says very clearly that she uh, used, uh, she started, from this idea proposed by Wolf in A Room, a room of One's Own, so Chloe and Olivia, to, to write uh, these stripes, these uh, comics, uh, which says, I wanna see, uh, wanna see a movie and get popcorn? Well, I don't know, I have this rule. See, I only go to a movie if it satisfies the three basic requirements. One, it has to have at least two women in it. Two, uh, these women must talk to each other about, um, uh, I'm sorry, um, they must talk to each other. And three, uh, they must talk about something which is not a man. So something be besides a man. Oh, pretty strict. Uh, 
she says, the other, the, the, the friend says, but, um, but a good idea. No kidding, last movie I, I was able to see was Alien. The two women uh, in it to talk to each other about the monster. Oh, I see. When I go to my house and make popcorn, oh, now you're talking. So this is um, a part of the comic, but this uh, thing she says developed what is now known as the Bechdel test. And you, uh, I gave you the, the website, you see uh, HTTP uh, and then bechdeltest.com because it's very funny to see how many movies or books pass the Bechdel test. You'll see that many uh, you know, famous movies do not pass the Bechdel test. Just an example that you, your student will surely know is Avengers. The Avengers one, because then you have the feminist turn in, with Marvel, with Captain Marvel and all uh, recent Avengers like um, uh, oh my God, oh, my son kills me if I don't remember the title. Um, however, the, the two most recent ones uh, are absolutely, they do pass the Bechdel test. But Avengers 1 does not pass the Bechdel test because in the story, there are two women. Uh, uh, they probably have a name, but they don't speak to each other about something which is not a man. When, uh, you know, uh, Natasha Romanov speaks uh, to the assistance of a fury, they speak, they only speak about Iron Man or Thor. Okay, so this is always the problem. Even while there are, they are saving the galaxy and the universe, they just speak about man. So of course it's just a joke, okay? It's not a rule that you have to keep uh, or you don't have to teach literature which respect the Bechdel test. I'm absolutely against this kind of thing. I, I mean, but it's nice to see with students that uh, let's see how many movies pass the Bechdel test. Let's pretend this and that to make them understand that we have been narrated a, a structure of feelings, you know, a structure of relationships among women, which is not always correct, which is not telling all the truth. And then of course, women are forced to grow up with the idea that they hate each other, that they are enemies to each other. Okay, so this was just an idea that you can offer to your students. But then up to modernism, which is really, you know, something you have to face uh, when you work with your classes. And so the final part of my talk will be on modernism. So of course, Virginia Woolf is one of the master of modernism, but I think that it's very interesting to use her essay to support your um, classes uh, when you teach modernist authors in general? Well, she writes in particular two essays which are uh, very useful uh, and which must be used, I think, um, because it, it, it is so much easier than to introduce modernist issues to students. The first one is modern fiction. And I must say, you usually find passages of modern fiction in anthologies. I, you, I must say, I must thank um, Paolo because he was the one who shared with me uh, the um, extracts from his anthologies. And so I could really see what you also have uh, and have an idea with what I have. And I see this is usually the part of the essay which you find in anthologies. Uh, and well, this is great because I really think that this is the best way to explain modernism to students. Because here, uh, Wolf sp speaks about this ordinary mind on an ordinary day, which is absolutely what modernism is about. But sometimes, uh, since she says, examine for a moment an ordinary mind of an ordinary day, um, sometimes this is considered uh, as the description of the moment of being, which is not. I will come to this uh, uh, after this uh, slide. What you, uh, I think, you really have to uh, work on with this passage uh, is uh, what modernism is about. This ordinary mind on an ordinary day is what you find in Wolf, 
in, for example, Mrs. Dalloway or in her short stories, what you find in James Joyce, what you find in Oxley, what you find in Italo Svevo. Okay, Zeno Cosimi is an ordinary man. Well, on many ordinary days, I know, but he is, is a very ordinary life, okay? The anti-hero is very modernist, but also Prufrock by T.S. Eliot is an ordinary mind on an ordinary day, okay? He, um, he, uh, he can count his life with, co- he, I, I measure up my life with coffee spoons, he says in Prufrock. And wow, I, I, I love that verse so much, you know, but the, the idea is that mm, his life is always the same. You can measure it out with, with coffin spoons because he's an ordinary mind and he is living an ordinary day. What count in modernist fiction is that you record the impressions that the mind receives even on an ordinary mind on an ordinary day. So behind, outside the moments of being. And the, the impressions might be trivial, fantastic evanescence or engraved with the sharpness of steel from all sides that come, an incessant shower of innumerable atoms. And as they fall, as they shape themselves into the life of Monday or Tuesday, which is the title of the first collection of short stories by Wolf. And it's not a case, not, it's not a chance, sorry. Um, the accent falls differently. The moment of importance came not here but there, so that if a writer were a free man and not a slave, she means if he could write what he chose and not what he must, if he could base his work upon his own feelings and not upon convention, there would be no plot. There would be no comedy, no tragedy, no love, interest or catastrophe in the accepted style and perhaps not a single button sued on as the Bond Street tailors would have it. Life is not, well, this is the most famous sentence, you know, describing modernism. Life is not a series of lamp, of jig lamps symmetrically arranged. Life is a luminous halo, a tra- semi-transparent envelope surrounding us from the beginning of consciousness to the end. And again, this is the description of modernism, not a series of jig lamps, which means that you don't have to respect the plot to have one fact after the other, because this is not how life works. And with this, with this very passage, you can explain Joyce, you can explain uh, T.S. Eliot, you can explain Axley, uh, you can explain um, Odin, you can explain Yeats, okay, not the early Yeats, but the second coming, you can use this part. So you can use this passage to enter into so many modernist minds. Why do I say that this is not uh, the moments of being? Because the moments of being uh, is better introduced in another essay, much later on, okay, 20 years later, 1939, which is titled A Sketch of the Past. You, sometimes you find this uh, in anthologies, uh, but not always. She um, is recalling about her past and how she became a writer. And um, she says interesting things. First of all, well, this idea of the so-called novels. Often when I've been write, writing one of my so-called novels, you know, her ideas, I will be back to this idea, but her ideas that she's not writing novels. She is writing something different from novels. She knows she's working on on the matter in a different way, in a new way. I have been baffled by this same problem, that is how to describe what I called in my private shorthand non-being. You see, she's more worried about describing non-being than being, because describing a moment of being is easy. A moment of being is the one in which you feel you are alive. You perceive life around you. You feel that being yourself in that very moment is worth it. And Clarissa Dalloway has this moment of being, for example, it's very clear in Mrs. Dalloway, she says, life was there. Now, London, this moment in June, that is a moment of being. 
being there in a beautiful sunny day in London and how many of us would like to be in London in a sunny day nowadays, you know, in June when there is this incredible weather in, in London and it's a sunny day and you are in this incredible city and you feel yourself alive and that is a moment of being. But it, a moment of being lasts for all day. A moment of being is a moment. Then the day is made of so moment, many, so many moments of known being. Okay. And she says every day includes much more non-being than being. Yesterday, for example, was, as it happened, a good day, above the averaging being. But these separate moments of being were, however, embedded in many more moments of non-being. This is always so. A great part of every day is not lived consciously. When it is a bad day, the proportion of non-being is much larger. I had a slight temperature last week, almost the whole day was non-being. The real novelist can somehow convey both sorts of being. I think Jane Austen can and Trollope, perhaps Thackeray and Dickens and Tolstoy, I've never been able to do so. I tried in Night and Day and in the years. Well, here she I want to introduce how she tries. She experiments. This is what we mean when we say Woof is experimental. She tries, okay? She does not succeed. She tries. And she tries to describe this large proportion of non-being. It's very interesting. She says that Jane Austen can. According to Virginia Woolf, Jane Austen was a master in the description of non-being because, you know, the days of uh, her characters were more or less always the same. And she was so great in describing non-being, you know, this empty conversation which characterized the lives of her protagonist, of her heroines, but in such wonderful ways. You know, you read Jane Austen and it's so wonderful and so funny, uh, but, uh, but it's just non-being. And so she says she's such a master in this. Okay, sorry. The other essay I really suggest reading, and it's never present in uh, anthologies, and that's so much a pity, is Mr. Bennett and Mrs. Brown. Again, you find it for free in English, and you find it translated by Nadia Fusini in Italian. It's a, it's a great translation. Here, she says, uh, fundamental things, uh, both to understand uh, uh, modernism in general, and also to better understand um, how characters are treated in modernist novels. Well, first of all, here in this essay, she says a crucial uh, thing. Okay, she claims that in or about December 1910, human character changed. Well, this is strong. In or about December 1910, you are being so precise about such a huge thing like human character change. What happened? In December 1910. Well, it happened that the first exhibition of post impressionist took place in London. It was organized by Roger Fry, who was a friend, a member of the Bloomsbury Group. So you remember the great friends? Roger Fry will become the director of the National Gallery. And he, well, before becoming the director, he will organize. He organized, I'm sorry, in the past, um, this ex exhibition of post impressionist at Grafton uh, Galleries in London. And if you look at uh, Picasso's paintings, for example, you can find modernism in images. You see, um, Cubism is so much modernism in figures, okay, in images. Because here, you see every fragment of how you perceive something, how you perceive the existence of a person, of a place, of an object. This is how um, uh, cubism works, okay? You don't put on, uh, on the canvas what you see, but also what you know about the existence of that thing. And you cut it, you make fragments of it, and you put it all together. So reality is distorted in order to transmit, to pass to the audience a better sense of reality. 
That is why Wolf says that human character changed in December 1910, because after this exhibition, no writer, no artist could go on working in the same old way. Something has, had changed forever. Reality could no longer be described as it had been described for centuries, okay? And this is what she says in modern fiction, okay? Remember that modern fiction sh starts with Wolf saying that we, make so ma we made so many progresses with cars uh, and we're still at the same level with fiction. We did nothing new compared to Jane Austen or even worse compared to, we are even worse compared to Jane Austen. So what she is saying in Mr. Bennett and Mrs. Brown is uh, we must find a new way to represent reality. We must find a new way to represent the character. And if you read this with your students, it's so great. You can touch the topic of fake news because she speaks about reality and she speaks about the fact that if uh, you keep telling people that you know men have a tail, at finally they will eventually believe that men have tails. So you be you must be very careful in what you say. And then she explains how you have to build a character. And she concludes the essay with a fundamental statement that readers have to tolerate the spasmodic, the obscure, the fragmentary. And you see fragmentary cubism, the fragments is such a, a fundamental element of modernism. Think of the end of wasteland. These fragments I've gathered upon my shore. You, re you remember? Well, fragments is the point of everything, you know. Uh, the Cantos by Ezra Pound, again, fragments. So tolerate the spasmodic, the obscure, the fragmentary, the failure. Your help is invoked in a good cause because she says we are on the verge of a great change in art and literature and you must be protagonist in this. And I think this is such a strong invitation to make to students as well. I know that what we are going to read together, if we are going to read a modernist author, is going to be difficult, is going to be spasmodic, is going to be obscure, it's going to be fragmentary, and you will probably fail. But you have, you have to tolerate it, because at the end of it, your um, knowledge will be improved, and you will be enlightened. Okay, allow me to use these strong words. But the sense is you will switch on the light on your knowledge and you will be able to connect one thing to the other. And that's the great thing about modernism. So if we want to then uh, pass to the very last part. So I, I know I, I, I've been telling a lot, but I swear this is the very last part of my presentation, textual analysis, because then this is what you have to do with students. Okay, You have to read the text and work on this. Uh, with them. And, you know, sometimes uh, it's the first time for them that they face uh, interior monologue, uh, stream of consciousness, free and direct speech, and this is difficult. And we don't have similar examples in Italian, because in Italian we don't have this kind of literary tradition, so it's something they have to experience for the first time in a foreign language, and this is very difficult. But again, tolerate the spasmodic and the obscure your help is invoked in a good cause. You will be part of the meaning you will be creating. And this is a very strong stimulus for a student, I think. So textual analysis. Um, I will start with uh, Mrs. Dalloway and then touch uh, to the lighthouse briefly. Um, well, Mrs. Dalloway is the second experimental work by Wolf, uh, but the first is Jacob's Room, and I won't suggest to, to touch Jacob's Room in uh, schools unless you have a very good class because it's really experimental and it's a bit difficult. Even though for the topic it touches, I think it's much more fit, you know, to uh, teenagers uh, uh, than Mrs. Dalloway, because it speaks about a young boy who becomes a student and it has to do with war. So there are so many elements which are very strong, but you never find Jacob's Roman anthologies. You usually find Mrs. Dalloway, and I always suggest starting uh, touching Mrs. Dalloway using uh, her diary. 
Because in this way, it's much clearer what we mean when we say that Wolf is an experimental writer. Because, you know, you, we can speak of experiments and think of uh, uh, scientists in a laboratory, but what does it mean to make research, to make experiments with literature? Well, Wolf Diaries uh, are very clear with this. And I suggested you some passages, uh, you know, some uh, days uh, which might be used uh, uh, so that you don't have to use the entire diary because that would be impossible. Mm -hmm. uh, but just so you know, you can download the complete work by Wolf uh, in Kindle for uh, 99 uh sense uh, okay no, 99 centesimi less than a euro you can download the entire work by wolf uh, included a writer diary and the complete diary by wolf okay so once you have you know the day in which the, the diary entry you can then find it easily so on 14 october 1922 three years before the publication she starts thinking about the book and she says something interesting. Mrs. Dalloway was a short story she had written. Mrs. Dalloway has branched into a book, okay? Uh, it was translated as Mrs. Dalloway ha messo i rami, è diventata un libro. Well, it's beautiful, the idea that she branched uh, into the book. And I had on break here a study of insanity and suicide the world seen by the sane and the insane, side by side, something like that. Septimus Smith, is that a good name? You find here the whole book, sanity and insanity, suicide, and then there's criticism to society, and she introduces Septimus Smith. And Septimus Smith is a character that is almost never mentioned in uh, anthologies, and that's a pity because he is such a good character to speak about World War One. To your a students. good character to speak about World War One. Oh, I, I feel myself. Uh, I, I don't know. Oh, okay, <laughs> uh, because you see, through Septimus Smith, you can introduce the problem of war through a very different perspective, not the one of, uh, uh, you know, the battlefield, uh, uh, the front. Uh, but the problem of the war lasting after the war ended. So Septimus is back from war, he's a veteran and he is shell-shocked. Nowadays, we would say that he has a post-traumatic syndrome, uh, post-traumatic stress disorder. Well, uh, Septimus is an example of the, the kind of man that became invisible after the war. So it's so fascinating to treat this aspect through Septimus, but I have no time today to treat about, to speak about this. To speak about experimental writing, on 19th June, she's in the middle of writing of uh, The Hours, which as you probably know, was the first title of Mrs. Dalloway. But now, what do I feel about my writing? She asked, this book that is The Hours, is that his name? One must write from deep feeling, said Dostoevsky. And do I, or do I fabricate with words, loving them as I do? No, I think not. In this book, I have almost too many ideas. I want to give life and death, sanity and insanity. I want to criticize the social system and to show it at work at its most intense. Again, you see how... She knows what she wants, but she is working on her style, on her prose, on the way to, you know, to pass this idea. And this is, this, this is what experimenting means, uh, not simply passing a plot, a series of jig lamps symmetrically arranged, but conveying feelings uh, and criticizing the social system. That's what Mrs. Dalloway does. And then again, I'm writing the hours from deep emotion. Of course, the mad part tries me so much, makes me, my mind squirt so badly that I can hardly face spending the next weeks at it. So she, it's difficult for her to write about this because she really has, you know, to tear her skin off in order to write this, to pull herself completely on the paper. It's a question, though, of these character. People like Arnold Bennett, oh, it was her enemy, okay? Arnold Bennett was the one who is 
very uh, traditional and conservative. And he said that she was unable to create characters that survive. For those of you who still remember who Arnold Bennett is, uh, you will know that he is not really remembered as well as wolf characters. So he was probably not so right. So people like Arnold Bennett say, say I can't create or didn't in Jacob's room uh, characters that survive. My answer is, but I leave that to the nation. Well, the answer is uh, Mr. Bennett and Mrs. Brown, okay, the very essay I mentioned before. It's only the old argument that the character is dissipated into shreds now, the old post Dostoevsky argument. I dare say it's true, however, that I haven't, I haven't, sorry, uh, that re reality gift. I insubstantize, willfully to some extent, distrusting reality, its cheapness. But to get further, have I the power to convey the true reality or do I write essays about myself? You see the kind of questions she is asking to herself while she writes this novel. And I think it's so important you introduce this novel through these questions in order to make students understand that what they are reading is an experiment. It's new. No one had, did, had done something similar before. Nowadays, it's easy. I mean, you, you find everything starts in medias res. Movies starts in medias res. But in 1995, Mrs. Dalloway said, uh, started with Mrs. Dalloway said she would buy the flowers herself. Well, strong. <laughs> and again, in the same day, she says, uh, to return to the hours, uh, uh, the design is so queer and so masterful, so she likes the design. I'm always having to wrench my substance to fit in. The design is certainly original, and it interests me hugely. I should like to ride away, and away I did, very quick and fierce, needless to say I can't, and in three weeks from today I shall be dried up. She was always very negative when she was writing. But what is interesting is that she is speaking like from the outside. The design interests me hugely. So it's like she's reading herself from the outside and she is interested in what she is writing. Okay. And then she speaks about the discovery. Again, when we mention experimental writing, a discovery is what she makes while she writes. And that's why it's so important to mention the diaries. And what she, she discovers is that she digs out beautiful caves behind my character. I think that gives exactly what I want, humanity, humor, depth. The idea is that the caves shall connect and each comes to daylight at the present moment. So here, here you know how you have to read Mrs. Dalloway. Here you are prepared to how Mrs. Dalloway works. That sometimes you enter the mind of a character and that mind leads you to the mind of another character. And you have to be very careful to understand when this happens. And then you come back to the surface through the mind of another character. And she dig these cave, caves behind her character's mind. But you see, it's a discovery she makes and she even gives a name to this discovery. It took me a year's groping to discover what I call my tunneling process by which I tell the past by installments, as I have the need of. This is my prime discovery so far. You see, I, I'm, I mean, I, this is so great. She's experimenting. She's in her laboratory, okay, which is the study, the room where she writes. She makes a discovery and she gives a name to her discovery, tunneling process. And this is how we call Wolf Style today tunneling process and we ask students please describe the telling the, the tunneling process well you have to tell them how this tunneling process was born I think because this is the only way to make them involved in the creation so of course uh, this is fundamental um, uh, for, to, in order to understand this, it's also fundamental to understand that the psych, at a philosophical level, okay, the discourse about time was uh, very fashionable, okay. Henri Bergson was well known. She had not read Bergson when she wrote uh, Mrs. Dalloway, but Bergson was discussed in her uh, group of friends, so she probably had an idea of his uh, theories. And she was a friend of T.S. Eliot, and T.S. Eliot had worked with Bergson, so of course there was relation. 
And Bergson uh, did this very important distinction between historical time and psychological time. And, you know, if you need connections through other uh, subjects like uh, philosophy, well, that's great. Time is a great topic uh, through which you can touch several uh, subjects. You can cooperate with uh, uh, the teacher of psychology or the, uh, I'm sorry, psychology. Yes, it would be nice to have it at high school. But uh, um, I was thinking of uh, philosophy or also, of course, uh, of Italian literature. And so, however, a similar kind of treatment of time is to be found also in Mrs. Dalloway, where we have an external time, which is the Big Bang, and the hours, which is the only way in which the novel is framed, because the novel is not divided into chapters. You only have the Big Bang striking the hours nine times. And this is the only way in which the book is divided. Mm? and you don't have real divisions also, okay? And it's linear and measured in terms of space, London, okay? But then, of course, all the books is inside. It's internal, subjective, and measured in terms of emotions and not in terms of space. Hmm? So there are so many interiors, uh, monologues and ideas, etc. She also mentions this uh, in another extraordinary book, which is Orlando, uh, which is a funnier book uh, if uh, you want to suggest your students to read uh, an entire novel. And in Orlando, she mentions this extraordinary discrepancy between time on the clock and time in the mind. Mm? And this is exactly Bergson's idea of time. Mm? And they, she had not read Bergson, but you know, these kind of ideas were in the air of intellectuals in Europe at the time. So this is usually um, the passage from Mrs. Dalloway that you find in anthology. Okay, the moment in which she reached Park Gates uh, uh, and she observes uh, the omnibuses at Piccadilly. She would not say of anyone in the world now that she, they were these or were that. She felt very young at the same time and speakably aged. So here, well, it's very interesting because we are inside uh, Mrs. Dalloway mind and you can take examples of uh, um, free and direct speech and a, a sort of interior monologue as well. But I think it's quite complicated for students to really get the point because they don't know who uh, Mrs. Dalloway is unless you introduce her to them very well. Uh, there is this uh, Frowling Daniels mention, and you don't know who this Frowling Di Daniels is uh, because um, she's not an important character in the novel. So, and, and you don't have uh, the perception of the importance of time here. So, I usually suggest to start with the very beginning of the novel, which is a, another famous uh, part of the novel. And also, it's very easy to find, you know, you don't have to reread the entire novel in order to teach it because of course you don't have time and know it very well. Um, but you have the very beginning in medias res, okay? And so you hear, you can speak about um, how different it was, the way to, to, to talk about things, to talk about reality and so on. So Mrs. Dallow is said she would buy the flower surf. And then you really have the interior monologue so Lucy had her work cut out for her. The duels would be taken off their hinges. Rampanaya's men were coming and then thought Clarissa Dalloway wore a morning, fresh as if he should to children on a beach. And then bang, we're back to the age of 18. We're back when Clarissa was a young girl. What a lark, what a plunge. For so it had always seemed to her when with a legal squeak of the hinges, which as she could hear now, she had burst open the French windows and plunged at Barton into the open air. So you see here on how many levels you can work. You can work with the past, you can work with feelings, you can work with, uh, brace yourself, uh, Proust uh, and involuntary memory, because the squeak of the hinges uh, is exactly Proust Madeleine. The taste of the Madeleine for Proust uh, and the sound of the hinges for Wolf, which, as you, I hope you know very well, the, um, involuntary memory is not uh, the moment of being. But sometimes uh, I find it uh, compared in anthologies, uh, and I'm really sorry because there's something very different. 
why uh, do I say that this is so useful? Because apart from these, time is so clear. Uh, I used different color to show the present, the past, and the future, all in the first page of the novel. So with one page, you can touch so, en- so many elements. It's true you don't have the Big Bang striking the hours, but you have Clarissa f- feeling the moment and feeling a moment of being when she opens the door and think, what a morning, fresh, as if issued to children on a beach. Well, this is a moment of being. This is feeling the fresh air, the, this beautiful moment, the fact that she was would go and buy the flowers, something she loves doing. She is giving a party. She is happy. Okay, this is a moment of being. And this moment of being make her think of, about her past. And here you can introduce about Clarissa's past, okay, which is such an important part of the novel because she keeps going, you know, back and forward, back and forward from past to present, from past to present. And you have to tell students how they must proceed because otherwise they get lost in a way or another because if they don't know about Barton and Sally Seaton, they won't be able to follow you. And then the future, Peter Walsh and Peter Walsh make her think about the future. He would be back for it from India one of these days, June or July, she forgot which for his letter were awfully dull and blah, blah, blah. And then we will discover that Peter Walsh is just back from India and so it will be part of it. Then, of course, I, I, something I do, but uh, you probably do better than me. Uh, you, better, you, you do this better than me, I'm sure. But it's just a suggestion. I usually uh, use this very part to make the difference, you know, be, between free and direct speech. How would it work if it were quoted or direct speech? Eh? Okay, I will, Mrs. Dalloway said, comma, uh, in open inverted commas, I will buy the flowers myself, close inverted comma, full stop. Um, or reported or normal and direct speak. Mrs. Ballard says she would buy the flower herself. It's true, it's the same. Uh, but then, then Clarissa stopped for a moment to think how that morning was beautiful. She thought it was so fresh to appear as if it was issued to children on a beach. We wouldn't need all these in reported speech. But with free and direct speech, as you know, we are inside the mind of the character and we don't know, we don't need all the rest. So it's much more direct. And this is how Wolf was experimenting. Okay, this way of writing is something we do nowadays, but it was absolutely new, brand new when Wolf did it in 1925. And then you can use the free and direct speech to make a difference with stream of consciousness, because of course, Wolf does not use a uh, stream of consciousness as um, Joyce does, as Joyce does, okay. Uh, you can make the example from Mrs. Dalloway, the very, fir- the very same part. So you always use, you know, the same text and then makes a comparison with any part of the Ulysses, which is so different, no punctuation, okay. Uh, words written together so completely different really the stream of consciousness the stream of thoughts you don't have such things in Mrs. Dalloway you have something similar in the waves but I don't advise reading the waves with students at high school uh, unless you are you have a really really um, good class with which you can really work well together very quickly, the last five minutes uh, on to the lighthouse, because this is the other typical novel that you, it's faced in high school. Um, again, starting from the diary is good because while she is writing, she writes something d- interesting. Uh, she says that she will invent a new name for my books, the supplant novel, a new by Virginia Woolf. But what? Elegy? Well, elegy is the word that comes to her mind while she is writing to the lighthouse. So we have to read to the lighthouse as an elegy. Un elegia al faro, okay? An elegy to the lighthouse. An elegy to her family because she rebuilds her family. It's a monument she builds for her own family, for her parents, her sisters, and her siblings, okay? Again, uh, here she is speaking on 20th, 20th July. She's speaking, she's writing about to the lighthouse, and then she writes how she conceives the book. And it's important to let 
uh, students know that the book is divided into three parts. The drawing room window, seven years past the voyage. Okay, so the central uh, part, chapter two, will be time passes. That very, very experimental uh, chapter, which really contains some stream of consciousness too. Um, usually the passage you find in anthologies is this one. Turning, she looked across the bay and there, sure enough, coming regularly across the waves, first two quick strokes and then one long steady stroke was the light of the lighthouse. It had been lit. In a moment, he would ask her, are we going to the lighthouse? And she would have to say, no, not tomorrow. Your father says not. Happily, Mildred came in to fetch them and the bustle that distracted them. But he kept looking back over his shoulder as, as Mildred carried him out. And she was certain that he was thinking, we are not going to the lighthouse tomorrow. And she thought he will, be remem he will remember that all his life. Well, here you have to explain so many things. You have to explain who this he is, James, her little son, hmm? uh, the younger of her sons. Uh, you have to explain the relationship with, her with the father, with Mr. Ramsey, and the idea uh, that is uh, uh, transmitted is only the, the bad side, both of Mrs. Ramsey and of Mr. Ramsey. No, not tomorrow. Your father says not. Okay, it's the father who says that it cannot go to the lighthouse and this promise uh, that she would like to make to her son cannot be true. Well, of course, this is such a strong passage and it's important to read. But uh, what I suggest uh, is a passage uh, in um, part one, chapter 11. Uh, is, is, is it chapter 11? I can't see, uh, but I think so, yes. Um, he turned and saw her. Ha, ah, she was so lovely. Well, here it's Mr. Ramsey who sees Mrs. Ramsey after the children have, has, have gone to bed. So this passage comes after the passage, the previous passage, okay, in the chapter. And he thought Mr. Ramsey looks at Mrs. Ramsey and she, he thinks that she is lovelier now than ever, but he could not speak to her now that James was, James was gone and she was alone at last. After all day taking care of the children, now she was alone. She had the time for herself, but he, he resolved, no, he would not interrupt her look at how she chooses these words you know we are in a very typical victorian family but her father mr ramsay is able to see that her doing nothing alone after all day with the children is something she is actually doing making so much so that he does not want to interrupt her she was aloof from him now in her beauty in her sadness he would let her be. Well, he would let her be is such a strong sentence for a Victorian man, you know, with a Victorian wife, he would let her be. So difficult to translate in Italian. Mm? Uh, he passed her without a word, thought it hurt him that she should look so distant. So you see, uh, here, if you read this passage, you can really complete the portrait, the picture, with students and discuss of how incredible their relationship was, the, re the relationship between Mr. Ramsey and Mrs. Ramsey. They were two adults who loved each other in that so complicated way in which adults love each other, which is not, you know, always the, the romantic love in which every day is fantastic. You have to build your love step by step, day by day, and that is the reason why I say it's so difficult for students to read this novel and truly understand it. Because I hope that students this age usually don't know how difficult it is to carry on a love uh, through a long marriage, you know, through the age. And how hard and beautiful, okay, I want to be clear, but their marriage is that kind of marriage. And he passed her without a word, though it hurt him that she should look so distant, and he could not reach her. He couldn't do nothing to help her. And again, he would have passed her without a word had she not 
at that very moment, give him of her own free will what she knew he would never ask and called to him and taken the green shawl off the picture frame and gone to him for he wished she knew to protect her. That's the role of the two. He wants to protect her and she knows he wants to protect her and she knows they have the two roles, but they have respect one of each other. And that's at the base of their relationship. And in, with this picture, it's so much stronger to then introduce a very, very short passage about how she uses punctuation in this novel. Not only uh, semicolons, she makes great use of dashes and semicolons, but brackets. It, and this is really, I swear, the last point but brackets. Again, to her diary, while she is writing, she uh, says, well, the problem, again, she's working, you know, on, on her fiction experimenting. The problem is how to bring Lily and Mr. R, Mr. Ramsey, together and make a combination of interest at the end. Should there be a final page about her and Carmichael looking at the picture and summing up um, Ramsey's character? Uh, in that case, I lose the intensity of the moment. If this intervenes between Ramsey and the lighthouse, there's too much chop and change, I think. Could I do it in a parenthesis so that one had a sense of reading the two things at the same time? So how you see how she tries with herself, what can I do to make it look as I want it to look, to make it feel as I want it to feel? And she goes with parenthesis. And what happens in parenthesis? In time passes which is a great piece of writing. If you want your student to read these 20 pages, in time passes, huge things happen in, parent in parentheses, in brackets, okay? Uh, while the house is feeling the passing of time, is feeling the absence of, hum of humans, okay? Mr. Ramsey stumbling along a passage, stretched his arm, out one dark moment, morning, but Mrs. Ramsey having died rather suddenly the night before, he stretched his arms out. They remained empty. This is how the great, wonderful, marvelous character of Mrs. Ramsey that we have learned to know in chapter one, that developed so strongly in chapter one, dies. In a parenthesis, with Mr. Ramsey, that needed her so much. If you read the two passages, you perceive that he is not the bad man. He is not only the bad Victorian patriarchal conservative man, but he, is, he loves her fondly and truly. He stretches his hand out and finds no one because she died in parenthesis. So this is what being experimental means. And I think this is a, a crucial passage that should be read with students as well. So this is it for me, and I'm, I went a bit too long. I'm sorry, but the things to say were a lot. <laughs> so I just invite you to follow us if you are interested in our events. But I think uh, you had mo probably more than enough uh, with Wolf. <laughs> Thank you so much, Elisa. Thanks to you. Now, I, I need to close my presentation, but sometimes it happens that it, it doesn't allow uh, non mi fa usare il mouse, I'm sorry. <laughs> Let's see. Ok. Uh, vabbè. Mm, provo a... Se... Intanto voi fate e intervenite, io provo a chiudere, okay. che mi si incanta. Thank you, Elisa. Thank you very much. And um, should we have time for a couple of questions? What do you think? Is it too oh. late, Elisa, or...? No, no, for me, uh, oh, grazie, uh, thank you. Uh, no, no, I have all the time. I mean, okay. it's up to you. Okay, so let's see if there are, thank you very much, first of all. Okay, it was absolutely, extremely interesting, I would say, and uh, very passionate. Um, and, uh, well, I'm not going to ask you questions because I would really like to leave uh, um, the possibility to the students, especially, to ask questions. So, guys, uh, if you've got questions, uh, please, uh, can, you, can you please ask questions or write them down in the chat if you prefer, up to you. Oh, here there is one, uh, there is one. Um, can you please tell us, uh, hang on, because it's moving. Can you please tell us, uh, uh oh, 
Oh yes, I read about it. Virginia's vision of death, and also uh -huh. something about Septimus' death. Mm -hmm. How is, oh, uh, yes. is death connected to? Uh, yes, this, this is an important aspect. Um, in order to understand this connection very clearly, you need to read both uh, the diaries uh, and um, the uh, USA edition of the novel, because it contains uh, a little ad uh, at the end, and also the introduction in which she explains uh, that at first uh, it was Mrs. Dalloway to die in her idea of the novel. And you find if you have read or if you have watched the movie The Hours, mm -hmm. it's very clear through the character of uh, um, uh, Laura Brown, okay, uh, Laura, the, the, the one made by, um, is it Susan Sarandon? No. No. Um, no um, the, other uh, uh, the other one. I mean, I, I don't remember the name, I'm sorry, but I, it will come to my mind. However, uh, the idea is that at first... Oh, it is Susan Sarandon, I think. Uh, no, no, it's no, no, one. no, no, no. Uh, it's, uh... Julian Moore, thank you, Julian Moore. Julian Moore. Uh, Julian Moore. <laughs> Julian Moore. Uh, at first, uh, she wanted to, to be Mrs. Dalloway to kill herself. But then she uh, created in, in her mind uh, the character of Septimus, uh, and he was the one to die because it must be the poet to die. Okay, because it would be stronger. And also in this way, she introduces, uh, you know, the problem of shell shock, which was kept silent at the time. And so he dies uh, in her place. And he dies in order for Clarissa to perceive the beauty of life. She has been um, feeling bad and feeling good all day. Mm? It was so difficult for her, remembering of the old days at Barton and then feeling the coming of the party and then meeting, meeting Peter Walsh and feeling that probably she married the wrong man and trying to, re to remember when Peter first uh, proposed to her. So it was a very difficult day for her. And she, at the end, uh, this man comes to her party and mentions death and she is worried how is it to mention death at my party okay because she is bourgeois upper class she was only interested in appearances but then she, when she is alone she looks at the the woman on the opposite window and she thinks uh, well but he gave this away he gave it all away he gave his life away and the only thing i gave away was a penny i throw in the serpentine in uh, hyde park and she thinks he gave this away because he wanted to communication. Death is, uh, um, uh, how is it? Uh, death is, uh, I, I mean, I don't remember the precise words. However, uh, death, is, death, is, death is a try to communicate. He tries to communicate in killing himself. And so through this death, she can understand life better. And so, uh, of course, this was a very complicated passage because of which in Italy, it was not translated also because it contains this suicide that you cannot cut off. And during under fascism, it was impossible to include um, suicides in novels. So it was not translated in Italian until 19, well, it was translated before, but not published until 1946. So the role of death is this. Death is made in order to make life appear better, more clear, okay, than it appeared before, to make Clarissa feel the power of life. And then her own relationship with death, of course, is complicated. But I, I, I hate to um, watch her life and, her, and, her, and uh, her work through the final moment, okay, through how she chose to put an end to her life. She was not, not very young. She was very aware of what she was doing. She was very tired. Uh, she, she had many reasons uh, to do what she did. So I don't like to, because death is not so present in her life, uh, considering how present uh, in, in, in her work, I'm sorry, yes. considering how present it was in her life. That was incredibly present in her life, and she could have written only about death, 
but she wrote about life too a lot. I would say. Absolutely, absolutely.、Um, I was thinking, what do you say? Just because、uh, I was thinking what you've just said when you mentioned the last passage from、uh, Mrs. Dalloway, when. Uh, Uh, there is this、uh, moment of reflection. I mean, she's thinking, Mrs. Dalloway, about、uh, the fact what Septimus has just done、uh, in the after. I mean, what he did during the afternoon, killing himself, committing suicide, and the fact that she, she's somehow, so to speak, happy because、uh, this made her think about the importance of life. But, yeah, life is- she is happy. She had given him away. Yes, exactly. She- Would you say that this is close to a moment of being, or is it not? I don't know. Well, that's a good point. The moment in which we understand something. Yes, yes.、Um, I, I would say this is more similar to an epiphany, to an in my epiphany, opinion. Because I wanted to bring you there. Yeah, yeah, exactly. I, I would say this is more similar to an epiphany in which, in a moment in which you realize、like、something, something about yourself, about your life, about reality,、uh, yes, which is of course very different you, from moments of being. Exactly. I wanted you to explain maybe to our students,、uh, you know, the, the difference because sometimes.、Uh, There is this difficulty in the students to understand, to perceive the difference between the epiphanies, Joyce's epiphanies, and the moments of being.、Um, of course, it's easier to understand the moments of being from what you were saying before. So the difference between the moments of being and the moments of non-being. Yeah. Okay. And which、um, uh, you also made it clear the difference with the involuntary memory. Yeah.、Um, so could you say a couple of things about、uh, the epiphanies and the moments of being, so that?、Uh, yes. Well,、uh, what I always say is that we should、uh, look at the word epiphany is the revelation. Okay, the moment in which things are revealed to us, and the moment of being does not contain this element of revelation. It's a moment in which we, as a matter of fact,、um, perceive existence. Okay, we realize that we exist, that we are living and of life around us, but it's very different from the epiphany. In which you are, and a part of your life、uh, has light,、uh, and you see it for the first time. And these, and what you see, changes your entire existence, your entire life, also for the future. Changes your past, your present, and your future. And you are somewhat something different after you experience an epiphany. While you're not something different after you experience a moment of being,、mm-hmm. you're just happier, you're more satisfied, but it, it's it's different. So that's why I would say that that moment for Clarissa is more an epiphany because she feels differently. She changes thanks to、uh, Septimus,、mm-hmm. and it's an epiphanic moment indeed. And if you think of Evelyn、uh, to make the, the yeah, typical、yeah. short story you usually read with students. The moment in which she grasped, you know, the, 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 the stand at the bar、uh, at the、oh, dock,、uh, and, and and she stands still because she realizes、uh, what ha- what what she has to do comes、uh, from what happened the the day before, day before. listening, you know.、Uh, to yes, to the song and thinking about her mother and realizing that. She made a promise. She made a promise, and she could not be what she wanted to be. So that's a moment of revelation, which changed her life, and we see the result of it at the end. I was thinking also of the difference, which is、uh, given by the fact that the moment of being for Virginia is somehow, and you were saying it before, more you know pleasant, more you know positive. When whereas the epiphany in Joyce ends up eventually in the inability to act.、Uh, Of、yeah. the character, which is very negative in the end,、uh, because it is true they understand、uh, the character understands something about the history around life、uh, more clearly. But in the in the end, is he or she is not able to take action, and、yeah. therefore it's still trapped in that doubling,、mm-hmm. which is you know, really where the common man is. What they are saying, can you hear me? Yes, yes.、Uh, but I would like students to be reminded how to get. This、uh, recording on、uh, on YouTube because I read somewhere I read everywhere that yes, I mean, there are yes, some、uh, so many links uh, and uh, as yes, many of them are... might be interested in preparing some. Absolutely, speeches, Paolo. 
Thank you for telling me. Now, the link you've seen in the chat is the one to register your presence here so that you get to the attendance, uh, the certificate, whereas uh, the, the recording of this uh, uh, whole seminar will be on YouTube, okay, of uh, Mediateca Montanari, okay? Uh, and I might uh, possibly um, um, write the, 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 the Earl in the chat in a moment. Okay. Thank you, Paolo. Absolutely. Um, there is one uh, one uh, question I read before in the chat. Uh, yeah, I read two questions. And exactly. To one, I would just reply that one of you were asked, was asking about um, com the comparison between negative capability in Keats uh, and moments of being. Uh, I will not speak about this now because it's a very it's a complicated, I'm not a Keats expert. I don't like to speak about what I don't know. Also, uh, Professor Nadia Fusini is a great expert on these. And if you uh, look for these uh, on YouTube, you find one recent talk uh, Professor Fusini delivered in which she talks exactly about this. Keats negative capability. And she makes this, uh, this link to Wolf, because this is something she has worked on a lot. So I, 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 I would not like to say, you know, something wrong on this. And so I prefer uh, not to go deeper on this. On, on another question was how, uh, if I can, Valentina. Yes, uh, absolutely. Uh, uh, you can is, you can uh, you can use as much time as you want. I'm just writing down the link to the YouTube for our okay. Uh, I read uh, that someone was asking how they can introduce a wolf stand. Uh, well, first of all, how you would introduce any end. I mean, uh, it was her choice and it was a way she chose it. Uh, she seemed strong in Mrs. Dalloway. She was strong. She was strong in Orlando. She was strong in the waves. She was strong in the years. Uh, but um, she was ill. She was mentally ill okay she had mental problems and she knew it very well and she chose not to be completely cured from her problems because she knew that the fact of hearing voices the fact of having this lucid imagination was uh, tiring exhausting for her but gave her a special talent gave her that something special which allowed her to be what she was so she was scared of losing, if you want, her gift, if she was completely cured. Uh, but she had this great husband who was always by her side and was so precious for her. And she loved her life. And you, you, I, th I just think you have to mention it if you want. And sometimes they're very curious about it because teenagers are always very fascinated about, about suicide but, you know, she's not Sylvia Plath, uh, who has suicide everywhere in her work. If you read Mrs. Dalloway, there's this suicide, which was very clearly explained. Septimus has all the reasons for that suicide. And it's very clear and it's a strong critique to war, to society and to patriarchy, to, to patriarchy because it's the, this idea of a man who is no longer a man if he is not you know, masculine and sexually powerful and so on. So there's all this critique. Um, and then if you read Orlando, but Orlando is full of life. It's just life. I mean, Orlando never dies, okay? Uh, leaves through the centuries. So I, I think you can just say it was a moment of her life, the, the, the last one. And I, I, I think we cannot really completely know because why she did it. For sure, the war, they were, uh, Leonard was a Jew, so they, she, they knew they were on the list of the people who were, would have uh, been taken uh, to... Uh, concentration camps uh, should they be uh, invaded by uh, Nazis. So, of course, the moment was very uh, sad. Uh, her nephew had died. So, I mean, so many elements, so many sad elements in her life. Uh, to find a reason for this is difficult, and it's her private choice. I think we just consider this as a part of what she was, but not what she was, because if you read 
her letters, or, but also the diaries, not only a writer diaries, but the complete diaries. Uh, or uh, if you read what her friends thought about her, uh, there's this beautiful book, uh, Virginia Woolf and Her Contemporaries. Uh, um, Virginia Woolf is a contemporanei. Uh, it was just edited by uh, Liliana Rampello for Il Saggiatore. You have all um, uh, stories uh, by her friends uh, who recall Virginia, and they all speak about a person who was full of life, always laughing, so humorous and a genius. They all say she was a genius. So I think it's better to concentrate on uh, her genius and how the, the, the mental problem was part of her being a genius. And she spent her life uh, trying to you know to dwell to to, to work with this yeah. together mm. yes uh, any other question guys uh, students, i'm sorry uh, for the negative capability but really i don't feel like going deeper into it <laughs> no worries, no worries. but yes of course there is a connection this is for sure she loves keats uh, wolf loved john keats uh, you can see everywhere john keats no, no, I'm not modest. I know my limit. <laughs> Is there any other question about it? If there are no other questions, I would close with one question because you mentioned modern, fi modern fiction and you read the passage about the gig lamps uh, and the luminous halo. Um, would you make a comment on uh, what she moves on uh, when she I found it very clever. She mentions James Joyce. Oh yes, and uh, and uh, the way in which uh, he's developing this new. I mean, he's really in the moment of writing Ulysses, so it's yes. there, but it's not even finished. Um, but I think it's uh, it demonstrates how um, well aware she was of what was going on, not only of what has uh, um, happened in literature before. I mean, all yes. the essays she wrote about Jane, Jane Austen, about the Bronte sister, about uh, major and minor writers, uh, but also what was going on, you know, just beside her. Uh, so yes. you can uh, comment on that. Uh, yes, and also, it's so, yes, it, it's so important that she makes an example, because also uh, this is another pa uh, passage that can be used with students, uh, uh, because it's very easy to say, ah, oh, what you're doing is bad, it's wrong, uh, and we should change, we should, we should do something new. But then you have to say what you would say, would, would do, you know? Uh, well, give me ideas. What should I do? What should I... Uh, what should... Write about. Uh, yes, what should I write about? What should fiction look like? And she says, well, this young James Joyce uh, is on the right way. Uh, she was, uh, he um, was publishing parts of Ulysses uh, uh, in journals uh, and uh, she had already uh, read something by, his, by him. Um, and of course, she had received the manuscript uh, of the Ulysses. Uh, um, and everyone says, oh, she used this excuse that uh, the Hooker Press could not publish the book. Yes, people, it was huge. And the Hooker Press uh, printed, you know, at home. It was a home press. Uh, and Wolf made uh, the books letter by letters. Okay, she uh, composed the wasteland with her own ends. Okay, because uh, Leonard was trembling and he could not do that work. Then Leonard printed the pages and then she bound it herself by hand. Can you imagine Ulysses? Yeah. Okay, well, this 1, is... 1,000, yes. Okay. More than 1,000 uh, yeah. pages. She, she didn't really love the book, it's true, but from it, it was not so much an excuse, okay? It was not... Uh, the Ogre Press was not Penguin. Um, so, but she could see in James Joyce the future of fiction because she could see that he was trying something new. She was experimenting with style. She was working with words. With the real stuff. Yes, with the real stuff of fiction, as she says. And in fact, she speaks of materialists. Yes, you know, writers. And the modern. Yes. yes, exactly. Can I say something about yes. that? Uh, I mean, the things that you have been uh, talking about, Lisa, are uh, unimaginable for <laughs> textbooks that uh, no, yeah, are no. presented by editors to students. And so, um, I mean, um, I think it's uh, what you said is, uh, 
I mean, in, uh, unparalleled, I would say. Mm -hmm. And uh, and uh, yeah, I think it's it would be very difficult for an editor to be able to publish a book that he includes just a few of the topics that you dealt with because uh, it would be fantastic if you could just find a textbook because they are if you just take 10 or 20 textbooks uh, about literature they are all the same they yeah. deal with the same passages and uh, maybe different seen from different perspectives and so on and so it's just a kind, a kind of repetition of the same old thing it's just the story of one day she goes and buys flowers blah 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 blah. but if they began uh, presenting the story like you did uh, uh, like um, having a uh, a broader you know view on um, on, uh, on, on on the blood or by quoting even other things, I and mean, it would be quite interesting for students to be able to, even to, uh, to find uh, extra connections, but that's impossible, I would say. Now, no, I, I know it's I know it's difficult because it's a lot of material. I also think, well, also, uh, you know, scholars who write uh, anthologies for high school have to respect uh, certain requests are made by publisher and publisher know very well what school request and you know you usually do the same stuff because you know it works uh, and it has been like this for centuries but there's also a strong debate on how to change all this uh, things of how the authors to include in anthologies for example i think that uh what books offer nowadays, you know, the link to external material might be, you know, a possibility to have, I don't know, a QR code with a couple of uh, pieces of writing uh, on which professors can work. Uh, but probably, you know, you should ask an expert for each author and it would be very expensive. Yeah, it is, it <laughs> is the teacher's is... job. It is the teacher's job to try and find connections. Yeah, connections yeah, I know. Anywhere. It should be teacher's job. Who are, however, uh, <laughs> busy with uh, meetings uh, and uh, uh, if, I say it, uh, if I may say it, if I may say it, this is, uh, I think, one of uh, the few advantages of this uh, period of uh, um, yes. uh, distance learning and we have discovered all the Google Classroom and I, I used to work I mean always with photocopies uh, always because I'm always bringing additional material I mean uh, this morning I was reading with my uh, final year students uh, you know modern fiction um, and as well some passages from from a room of one's own but I've taken it from my you know I've got copies of the books themselves um, but uh, nowadays with the, the Google Classroom, I think it's easier because I just yes. upload things. I need yes. to scan them, of course. Uh, but yes, then I but upload it... them uh, or I download, as you were saying, from, from the internet and I cut and paste the parts I want the extracts. Yes, uh, absolutely. It it's easier. so much easier, um, yes. And I think it's, uh, it's something we're going to keep on working even after the end of this uh, yes. terrible period. Keep the positive uh, side the positive of this side, disaster. Uh, <laughs> yes, of this disaster. It is, it is one which uh, we should uh, keep in our work, I think. Yes. Yeah. Um, absolutely. Um, if there are no questions, uh, additional questions, uh, I would, uh, I wonder my students where they are because I knew they, were, they had questions. Uh, um, I think I, I have to go, Elisa. I thank you so much for thank being you. part of this. I remember <laughs> I was still in bed when I was writing my email because I, I remember well. Uh, as I told you, I, I got run over by a car. Now I can walk without crutches, but it's still a long way before coming back to normal. And um, I, I go cycling. <laughs> I can't go running anyway. But I mean, uh, it's been a pleasure to have you here. I think you are one of Italy's best. Uh, oh. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, no. That's and, uh, Let and, me uh, just uh, see, Paolo, is uh, Professor Zombie still here? Uh, if she can hear us uh, and if she, if he wants uh, to close uh, this seminar, I would be happy. Um, maybe he can hear us. Uh, 
Io ho pochissima batteria rimasta. Ok, don't worry. Uh, Thank you Paolo. Thank okay. you Paolo. I don't know if professor Giombi, professor Giombi, uh, avrei piacere se potesse concludere questo seminario e concludere uh, la series di quest'anno di Think Outside the Box, uh, mi farebbe molto molto piacere. Sì, sì, lo faccio volentieri, non senza alcun senza alcun titolo per farlo, ma se si è invitato... No, a... come no? Il nostro dirigente assolutamente no, vabbè, è la sì. persona più, più, no. più... che ha più titolo <ride> per concludere. No. E la ringrazio ancora. No, in questo caso no, perché appunto ci, siete dei, ci sono tra voi addetti ai lavori. Io so, ho, diciamo, ho, seguito, ho seguito gustando anche l'interesse del seminario e apprezzandolo anche per la, la, per la vivacità che ha, che ha sollecitato in conclusione per la fitta serie di interventi che vi sono stati. Eh, non ho competenze specifiche nel, sul, sul tema, ma indirettamente ne ho appena intuito la ricchezza. Insomma, di questo vi sono grato e vi ringrazio molto. Grazie a lei. È stato l'ultimo occasione, l'ultimo diciamo, sede di questi seminari, come dicevamo all'inizio, non abbiamo voluto interromperla questa serie, anche se eravamo tentati di farlo perché era, era, era impossibile vederci in presenza, però eh, seppure ridotta dalla dimensione della distanza, eh, la ricchezza che è stata seminata c'è stata tutta e eh, quest'ultimo incontro l'ha confermata. Quindi direi solo ad Maiora e a rivederci, a riproporci, speriamo davvero in presenza il prossimo anno con una nuova serie di questi seminari che contaminano, a, 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 diciamo, a partire dall'anglistica, dall contaminano anche settori diversi, territori di confine, come dice il, il titolo stesso della serie Thinking Outside the Box. Grazie ancora a tutti, in particolare e soprattutto eh, a, a, alla professoressa Foschi che un pochino è direi non solo l'anima ispiratrice ma anche la regia operativa efficiente de, di, questa, di queste occasioni. Grazie ancora. Grazie professor Giombi, grazie ancora, grazie Elisa, eh, grazie a tutti per essere stati qui con noi e veramente spero di vedervi tutti l'anno prossimo. Grazie a voi, bye 